let's do this. Hey guys, Chitta Fahadang is here for the third chapter in module two of the anamorphic cookbook. We've been talking about the difference between anamorphic lenses and adapters, then what sets cine lenses apart from their more affordable competitors. In this chapter, I'll go over different focusing methods or mechanisms. It was a very challenging video to make and a tough subject to easily explain. I had to do a lot of research for this episode and I'm still thinking some things could be clearer. The key aspect of focusing anamorphic lenses is that we have to address different magnifications in each axis. This means dealing with one focal length on the horizontal axis and a different focal length on the vertical axis, which is a trip into astigmatism. We'll talk about astigmatism in a later video, so subscribe now and you won't miss it. In short, it means one of the axes isn't properly focused. Properly focusing anamorphics also requires us to deal with two different depths of focus. And I had to look this up because I thought it was just another way of saying depth of field. Depth of focus is actually the acceptable tolerance for the placement of the film or the sensor inside the camera to still get an in-focus image. If this tolerance is exceeded, you won't be able to achieve perfect focus. This happens if your lenses aren't properly calibrated or your flange distance is not on point. This is even more critical when it comes to anamorphic lenses than adapters. I have an extra video about critical flange distance at the end of this module, so stay tuned. I'll talk first about adapters than lenses. Adapters, as we saw in chapter one, are afocal. This means that they need focusing optics behind them to create an image. Once you add a spherical lens behind the adapter, you can get a focused image. What we're making here is a front anamorphic design, meaning all the squeeze takes place before the aperture. More about that in a second. The quest here is what's called double focus. Your taking lens has a focus ring, but so does your adapter. The fact that adapters can't create an image by themselves doesn't mean they don't need to be focused. So double focus means setting both your taking lens and adapter to the same distance. This will produce a sharp, focused image. Needless to say, that takes a fair amount of time, and I've made a video before on how to speed up this process. Anyone following down this path will need practice and patience. I've given up on double focus a long time ago. Unless you wanna do like old time Hollywood and hire one assistant to pull focus for each lens, rack focus shots will cost you a lot. Let's focus a little closer. How do sphericals focus? In the majority of the cases, rotating the focus ring is changing the distance of the whole system from the sensor. The closest they come to the sensor, the furthest distances are focused. The closest point a lens ever comes to the sensor is infinity focus. What if we take advantage of that then? What if we set both the taking lens and anamorphic to infinity and then change focus on the whole system by moving both parts further away from the sensor? So when I got this Schneider Cinelux, it actually came in two parts. This is the spherical block, which has no iris and no focus ring. And this is the anamorphic block. I made a contraption so I could use this spherical and have focus on a regular camera. This is a helicoid and then we're gonna attach it to the camera and see how that works. So once I attach this, I have infinity focus, but I also can rack to something close. Great. What happens then if we add the anamorphic? What we want is to just have one ring and single focus it. So now I added this Cinelux in here and I'm just going to twist it to a line. And everything is very out of focus, but if I try to go to infinity, I actually get that in sharp focus. But as soon as I try to come for close focus, the image kind of breaks apart. Why is this happening? While the spherical is focusing by changing the distance of the entire block from the sensor, if we look close, the anamorphic block has its own focus scale. As soon as we try to adjust that, everything works because the anamorphic focuses by changing the distance of its own elements instead of the distance from the sensor. Sidebar, focus through adapters. If you looked into anamorphic adapters before, you might have seen some of them described as focus through. 
That's a term that I also sadly helped popularize. They're focus through adapters. Focus through adapter. Focus through anamorphic adapter. This is a focus through adapter. These are adapters that don't have a focus ring, like the Century Optics or Panasonic LA7200. So the idea is you focus your taking lens and everything is swell. Beautiful image quality. Wrong. It doesn't work quite like that. As we just saw, anamorphic adapters focus by changing the distance between their elements. So these focus through adapters actually have a fixed focus position and have suboptimal performance when focusing at any other distance. A much better name would actually be fixed focus instead of focus through. What a disappointment, hey? It sounded so good at first. If only we had a weight with just the distance between these elements. We'll come back to this idea later in this video when talking about synchro focus. But for now, let's look at how we can make the focusing experience better on a DIY rig. You might have heard the words focuser or variable strength diopters when researching anamorphic adapters before. In a simplified manner, these lenses allow us to do what we are trying to in the previous example, except they do it at the very front of the system. If you're worried about what's a diopter, we'll get to that on another day. For now, just think of these things as focusers. So our starting point was good, setting both spherical and anamorphic to infinity. Then we add the variable strength diopter or focuser, and this takes care of focusing. This is a pretty good solution, but it's severely limited when using a DIY setup as it offers no optimizations. You can't tweak your focuser to work better with a wider or a longer lens. As a matter of fact, your tweaking possibilities are quite limited since most manufacturers follow the same specs. The flaws of this DIY solution are particularly noticeable as you move towards more extreme, wider, or longer lenses. The concept of a variable diopter though is used in the vast majority of high-end front anamorphics. Sidebar, front versus middle versus rear anamorphics, and some water. Everything we covered so far, and most of what we'll cover in the future, is about front anamorphics. The term front anamorphic means the compression, or the squeeze, is taking place before the entrance pupil of the system. To quote Jay Hoblin's article, the entrance pupil is the image of the lens's aperture stop as seen from the front of the lens through the glass elements in front of the iris. And that is normally where the iris is located. Front anamorphics are what give us the anamorphic look. As we move to middle and rear anamorphics, the optical characteristics we expect from anamorphic lenses get more muted and almost imperceptible except for the squeeze itself. That's the case for many zooms in the 1980s, and more recently, Laowa's Oom 25 to 100 millimeter lens. If you look at the footage, you really can't spot any anamorphic traits. As I was saying, the basic idea of a variable diopter is used in plenty of cinema anamorphics. I'm doing air quotes around variable diopter because it's not as simplistic as a DIY setup. The biggest difference between DIY setups and cine lenses is the full control over design and construction of each element. Cinema lenses are optimized for performance at every focal length instead of having a versatile, swappable solution that is limited to an optimal condition like a DIY rig. The biggest drawback of focusers in the DIY universe is how you end up needing multiple of them according to the focal length of your taking lens. A wider taking lens will require a larger focuser, while a longer taking lens will require a focuser designed for longer lenses. There is no one-size-fits-all DIY solution, not if you want the absolute best in performance for every scenario. A common side effect you see from variable diopter focus designs for both DIY and cine lenses is a change in the field of view during focus racks. These focusers have varying degrees of widening your field of view. For example, in the Atlas lenses, your frame gets a little wider as you focus closer. Besides this method, a few others exist, 
Let's call them Synchrofocus, Linear Compensator, and Panavisions. The simplest one, introduced earlier in this episode as Double Focus, has the fancy name of Synchrofocus when built mechanically in cine lenses. As the name implies, it synchronizes the spherical and anamorphic movements to ensure vertical and horizontal focus matches. In cine lenses, Synchrofocus is found on Lomo square fronts, both original and rehoused, on the cheaper tier, that's what Suray uses with their 1.33 lenses. You have a locked front element, and as we saw, the spherical lens focuses by changing its distance from the sensor, while the rear anamorphic element moves with it. It's tough to engineer, but once designed, it's cheaper to produce than the other methods shown in this video. Synchrofocus's upside is it doesn't require additional glass, meaning for lighter and smaller lenses. The biggest issue with this solution is the squeeze factor changes over the focus range, making people look rounder than they are in real life as explained in module one. In practical terms, lens breathing during a rack focus will compress or expand the image. The linear compensator was originally used in Todd AO's anamorphics, and it uses a low power element or group inside the lens to control astigmatism. The easiest telltale is a different breathing from the other designs on this episode. This one much more uniform. It's not a very popular solution and it's pretty inaccessible for DIY solutions as it requires more optics and mechanics. Last, we have Panavision's focus method, which is formally called the counter-rotating astigmatizer. In terms of looks, this is somewhat similar to the linear compensator we just saw, but you can notice breathing only in the vertical axis. This type of focus rack is a total Panavision tell. Mechanically, you have more cylindrical elements to control astigmatism, but instead of traveling back and forth like the linear compensator, they rotate in position and ensure the horizontal axis never changes. What we learned from this is that most focus methods are inaccessible to DIY rigs. Even the ones that are accessible to us, like the variable diopter and synchrofocus in the form of double focus, are limited by what parts we have available. I guess I'm making it sound too much like a bummer, but even with those limited aspects, DIY rigs can produce amazing footage. Under ideal circumstances, they can match the looks of a cine lens and cost a fraction of the price. They're an excellent entryway into anamorphic shooting and a very affordable option. You don't have to spend a million bucks to make something awesome. Cine anamorphics have the advantage of being thoroughly designed and produced to the most precise standards. Not limited to what's available, but also not limited by budget. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these differences and if you were already familiar with all focusing methods. Shoot a comment below and join the conversation. If you wanna join a bigger conversation, become a member of the channel through the join button and you'll unlock an exclusive community of people on the same path as you and a handful of early videos. On the next episode, we'll be back to talk about different squeeze factors and what they mean for sensor usage and resulting aspect ratio. Thank you for joining and I'll see you then. Chitu Fehadengs, out.